faces in the crowd. Thank you for sticking around. My name is Saskia. And I'm Malta. And we both work on crisis response at Google, covering EMEA, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And both of us, probably like all of you here today, we're tech optimists. We believe in the power of technology to do good in the world and to tackle some of those really complex problems that we as humanity have long struggled with. Um, and today we're going to talk about humanitarian crises, specifically what Google does to help during a disaster, but more broadly we hope to show how technology in its many forms can help people in their time of most dire need. Now this is our company's mission statement, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And over the past 20 years, this mission statement has led us down many different paths. Across the past, yeah, 20 years, Search turns 20 this year. It's led us to develop core products like Search and Gmail and Maps to newer products like the Google Assistant, Google Photos, etc. But what I love about the mission statement is that it can apply to so many different products, but at its core, it's about one thing, and that's helping people. This is the coast of Greece as it looked to people who lived there just a few months ago. This is that same location. Um, this is that same location after the wildfires raged throughout the country in July. Now, it's almost impossible for me to imagine the devastation felt by the community that lived there. And in fact, I remember reading one resident described the arrival of the wildfire as a night from hell. In one single night, their whole lives changed. And we all know that a crisis doesn't just pick and choose where it's going to occur. And there are many different types of a crisis. Man-made, natural disasters, ongoing crisis, like the refugee crisis, for example. But no matter the type of event, there's always one universal truth in times like this. And that's that information is oxygen. Now this, of course, relates directly to our mission as a company. Sorry, slides are lagging. Um, and at Google, it's our goal to make sure that people have the most useful information in times like this, so that they can stay safe and informed and up to date. So today, we're going to talk about uh, the history about how Google got involved in crisis response. And that story begins about eight years ago. Sorry, our slides aren't loading. but. In 2010, um, Haiti was hit by a catastrophic earthquake. 230,000 people were killed, and 3 million people were affected. And the world jumped in to help, so first responders, um, local authorities, NGOs, companies, and Google, we wanted to help as well. So we sent down a small group of um, engineers to help get the country's internet infrastructure back online. And while they were down there, they noticed that there was actually no good way for people to track down missing loved ones. And um, the existing systems were spread across 14 different websites, and overall it was a confusing and fragmented experience. So in just three days, that same group of volunteers built a simple tool called Person Finder, which in this instance helped build up 50,000 records of missing people. And this was really the first tool that Google built um, for crisis response, and it was well received. And in fact, we saw, even after the earthquake, uh, that people were using the tool. So once again, in Japan, uh, when the tsunami hit there in 2011, as well as the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013. And these are just two examples, but you can see from the tweets behind me that people thought that this tool was really useful. But then, in 2015, the Paris attacks happened. Now, it started with an explosion outside the football stadium, and the terror and the confusion grew across multiple hours as attackers carried out six orchestrated attacks across the city. That night left 130 people dead and countless more terrified and confused. 
I still remember, probably like many of you, the details of that night. I was far away um, in California, but I remember Googling the news, trying to stitch together a picture of what was going on. And it felt like the whole world was looking on, trying to make sense of it all. And again, it's impossible to imagine the experience of the people actually there that night and the questions that must have been going through their minds. What's happened? What areas are safe? How do I get home? How do I get help? Is my family okay? But if, like me or the people there that night, you Googled Paris, this is what you would have seen. A travel guide. Now it was clear to us that we weren't doing as good of a job as we could have to provide useful information to people in times when they needed it most to stay safe and informed. And so at this point we really took a step back as a company and we pulled together people from across different products and different departments to reimagine how we could deliver a more useful experience to times like this when users really needed it the most. And it actually became a company level priority for us. And the result um, is something called SOS Alerts, which I'll let Malt walk you through now. Thank you. So this is SOS Alerts. Um, I want to go briefly through what an SOS Alert is. This is clearly a Google search result page, but it's kind of obvious that it is very different in its appearance. You see like a red banner that gives you this feeling of, oh, something urgent just happened, and it gives a clear outline on what happened and where did this happen. And what follows on this result page is not organic search results, but a set of elements that we put together that we believe is information that is really helpful to a user that is actually affected, potentially in Paris or is here in Barcelona, or someone who's just interested and wants to research the things that happen on the ground, all on the Google search result page. So the first element would be a carousel of reputable news sources where you can just skim through as the story develops to kind of get a feel for what has happened from various different news uh, sources. The second one would be real-time updates from local governments. So we tend to work with local governments where possible or federal governments to get this information from them firsthand and it is their way to communicate to users who are, as I said, affected or, or interested in what has happened here, the local authorities in Barcelona who can give real-time updates. One, oh, that was fast. Perfect. Oh, oh, that's perfect. Um, so afterwards, this is an example of where we try to leverage a Google product that we put into the search result page. So it's a Google map that people tend to know how to use it, and what we put on top of the Google map is the location of what, uh, the location of the incident as well as, not visible here, but evacuation zones, road closures. Like where do I have to go when I need to get out of that specific area on top of that Google map? Because every crisis is different. There is space for, for example, local authorities or NGOs to put information in it that we verify and then would add to a what we call help and information box. So, for example, if there is a person finder tool or an NGO has put together a person finder tool to find missing people, we can send people to that uh, very popular website or a specific emergency hotline that has been set up. And lastly, Another example of where we try to leverage something that we believe we are good at, which is Google Translate, that uses, uh, that is able to translate in over 100 languages, I think, by now. So, because people affected by crisis are not necessarily people from the local area. They might be tourists, like in Barcelona or like in the Paris attack. So, they might not know how to communicate with local people. So, what they do is they just take out the phone press whatever phrase is suggested, turn it around, and the phone will speak in French, in Spanish, to the person, the first responder that is in front of them. And Zaskia mentioned that already, but this has been a company-wide effort at Google, so we haven't just used it in search as a destination for users where people would go to, but also in Google Maps and other products. And I think at this point, uh, we announced just yesterday that we have seen 
since the launch last year, one and a half billion impressions for SS alerts, so that people could find what they really need to find in the moments that are probably the most important or critical in their life. We talked a little bit about Google products. We are just one of the companies that do something in the humanitarian space. We are a tech barbecue. There's tons of other companies, tech or non-tech, who actually do amazing things in the humanitarian space. And for that, we have a philanthropic arm, Google.org, that has, in the last year, I think, provided grants at the size of 250 million US dollar. And so they really try to support those humanitarian efforts that are outside Google. Here in the background, you actually see one of those partners, NetHope, who have helped through those grants to install low-cost Wi-Fi access points and have distributed Chromebooks during the refugee crisis in, in Europe, as one of those examples. So with all this amazing stuff, you might be wondering, are the days of the, res of the rescue dog over? I certainly <laughs> hope not, this cute little uh, furry fellow. But it is clear that technology has changed a lot in the way that we operate in the humanitarian space, actually in all kind of spaces of our life. Just if you look at internet connectivity, in 2017 we have reached a very interesting milestone where for the first time ever we had 50% of the global population connected to the web. Just beginning of this year, we hit another interesting milestone where for the first time ever we hit 4 billion people connected to the World Wide Web. And there's tons of other interesting technologies out there. Actually, when you go through the uh, venue here, you see all these interesting trends that seem to come out. And I want to give a couple of examples of things where we are not involved, but where we clearly see that humanitarian efforts are on, on their way or could do amazing things. Blockchain is one of those examples. I talked about it yesterday on the panel already, but blockchain, which seems to be associated with the financial industry only, actually has a very interesting aspect where you can build what is called smart contracts. So if you donate to a charity, you might feel like, does my kind of money actually go to where I want it to go? And blockchain technology would allow you to exactly track that to the very last cent of your donation or the very last euro of your donation. 3D printing is another example where if you are in an area where you don't have all the tools ready, you can actually just push a button and print that specific tool that is needed for that water pump or whatever you have. In fact, I think I've seen pictures of entire shelters being 3D printed overnight, so you don't have to have any human involved and just push that button. A third example is, and this is footage from the New York Times, who have published this after the Hurricane Florence, is drone technology. And don't think of a drone to just add your GoPro, but you can essentially add any sort of sensor. So that rescue dog doesn't have to go into this avalanche. You can just add sensors to find people who might be under the snow or in buildings that have collapsed. The last very interesting example that we came across uh, is from a completely different industry. Just a quick show of hands, who knows Fortnite? the game Fortnite. Any like gamers in here? Amazing. <laughs> Fortnite, for those who haven't heard about it, is probably one of the most popular online games right now. It uses what is known as the Unreal Engine. It's basically a gaming engine that powers this game. So Unreal Engine has been around for, I think, 20 years, just like Google, so for a long time. And the Weather Channel in the US has used that exact engine to build a simulation of what would happen if Hurricane Florence hits the coast. Because if you just put out information like, oh, the water will be three feet high, yeah, that's one thing. If you see something like that, that gives a whole different picture and really sticks in. So yes, it's undeniable that tech is spurring positive change, I think, in this landscape, and we're seeing some really interesting stuff today. But we're both confident that the most exciting innovation is still yet to come. And in fact, we're already beginning to see glimmers of what that future might look like. Um, machine learning and AI, for example, are already helping us better understand things like natural disasters. So flooding, um, unfortunately, is the most common and the most deadly natural disaster on the planet. This picture behind me is from Kerala, India, where just 
last month, a million people were displaced from their homes. And in fact, every year, an average of 250 million people are affected by flooding. We see an average of um, 18,000 fatalities and up to 20 billion US dollars in economic damages. But what's interesting is that a lot of this devastation is actually caused by a lack of preparedness. And in fact, when we see early warning systems, um, we see that they can actually lower, so early warnings for flooding can actually lower fatalities by 40% and lower economic damages by 35%. And it's just the simple power of information in a time like this, I think, is astonishing. But the problem is that um, the areas that need this information the most currently aren't getting it. So 75% of fatalities from flooding occur in China, India, and Bangladesh. And at the moment, these are exactly areas where the government is currently unequipped to give out early and accurate warnings. In India, for example, um, the current flooding prediction models are only able to predict kind of a broad region uh, that's susceptible to flooding. And you can see this behind me on the left. And the problem with this type of model is that over time, residents actually stop taking alerts seriously. So it's a bit like um, the boy who cried wolf. And so for the past year and a half, Google engineers have been using satellite data and elevation data and actually using AI to create a more accurate flooding prediction model. You can see that on the right. And this team of Google engineers are already working with the Ministry of Water in India to pilot this forecasting system um, in areas that have historically been badly uh, affected by flooding. And it's still early days, but the initial results are, are positive, and we hope that one day we'll be able to roll this out to many more people across the globe and help them seek safety sooner. Another quick example is actually just a few weeks ago, a group of Harvard researchers teamed up with um, engineers from our AI de department to publish research showing how they use machine learning to better predict the location of earthquake aftershocks, which can impact kind of uh, recovery um, in an area that's been um, affected by an earthquake. And so they looked at 118 different earthquakes and data that they had from those earthquakes and used machine learning to analyze that data and pick out, re uh, pick out trends that a human probably wouldn't have been able to spot. And the result is a model, and you can see an example behind me. Here the, the dark red region is the predicted area of earthquake aftershocks and the black dots are the observed location of those aftershocks. This is for um, one earthquake in particular. So you can see it's still imprecise, but it's better than what we had before, which the existing model to date was barely more accurate than the flip of a coin. So what we have now is better than chance, and that's, we see that as a meaningful step forward. Um, and again, just an indication, I think, of the possibilities that lie ahead of us with this type of technology. So with all this talk about technology, one thing is really important, and that is to understand that every humanitarian crisis, as the name says, is at the end of the day about people. It's not about technology. Technology is not this magical bullet that will just solve all those problems. In fact, when crises are about people, it is not just about the people who are directly affected. It is about first responders. It is about that policeman or policewoman on the ground who have to make decisions in split seconds. So there's all this information out there from people or different stakeholders that needs to be stitched together. And I want to kind of end with one last example that we thought is, is interesting to show because we basically, at some point, this actually feeds into the SS alert that we showed earlier. We launched a product that we call Public Alerts. And it's basically a Google map that people kind of understand. And we started to see that local authorities often have these, what they call CAP feeds, the Common Alerting Protocol, which is a global standard on how to provide severe weather information. But nobody would be able to really read through that. But if you start putting that on top of a map, that is a whole different scenario, because you can zoom in to your specific location and see how the severe weather might affect you, your family, or the people that are important to you. 
we then started to add other things like the evacuation information that would be out there, but in a completely different place. And then we teamed up with the team from Wales who have information on road closures. And if you start to add all those things, you actually have something that is really helpful and useful to users. And so we decided at some point that if you have information on shelters that is out there, that is one thing. But you actually have people in those shelters who might be able to report back, is that shelter full? Is it still available? Is it pet friendly? Because you want to have that fear of friend that you want to take when the flood hits. So all that kind of information put together actually becomes interestingly useful and a whole, whole different set. So if you think about it and to kind of leave it with that, Crises are about people, but when you zoom out and see this entire humanitarian ecosystem, there's so many parties and people and stakeholders involved that have all this information everywhere. And technology really can play an important role by putting all that information together, syndicating it, sharing it. Some of those examples we talked about is if you have prediction data, no normal user would be able to understand what comes out of a machine learning model. But if you start to have developers who kind of plug into that ecosystem, provide it to authorities who then would send it back to users, that actually helps people. And I think what we want to leave all of you with is technology is not that magic bullet, but at the same time, Literally, every technology will have a humanitarian angle. And if you haven't found that, it is probably a, an interesting idea to think about how the things that you do or the strengths that you have in your company, how you can try to take a technology angle. Because at the end of the day, we all are probably tech optimists, what I would say. And technology is really able to solve some of the greatest problems of our time. But we need to tread it with responsibility, with care, and with humility. And with that, I think we would love to hear your thoughts, your comments, questions, if there are any, or just think about how we can collaborate together on this. Thank you. Is that the first one from the last that, question? Yeah. <laughs> The, I don't know if the first one is from is that for, is that from our session or because it I think that was from the oh board. okay ah perfect uh, will it be the go-to solution I guess there's certain like physical limitations or constraint for a drone so you can't really transport major equipment I think uh, I've read about a an interesting pilot in Bhutan where the max speed on a highway is 10 miles per hour um, because of the monsoon, they basically don't have proper streets where they use drones to transport uh, certain devices or medical equipment or medications. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tough to define go-to solutions. We referenced this earlier, but so many crises, no one crisis looks the same. Um, and I think kind of the response is also a case-by-case -case basis, but we hope that, um, that it'll do good, I guess, yeah, but I don't know about go-to solution, but we'll see, I guess. time will tell. How do you manage the fact that uh, people in vulnerable situations might have to back off? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick note, um, I think that's one thing that we talk about is open, um, open data. And so Google search, for example, is something that's accessible to anybody, uh, regardless of, I guess, their background. And so for some, um, some situations, yes, that could be a factor, but we hope that, I think the ecosystem that Malta referenced um, is one that's open and open to all and one where people can share information kind of using technology as a conduit. And yeah, there's like so many more involved than just the kind of government or that specific authority. When we work with authorities, we would only work with those authorities where we believe that they are trustworthy um, to share, for example, these official updates that we showed for the Barcelona attack. So the city of Barcelona seemed legitimate enough to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you are affecting the solution? Um, well, I mean, clearly Google is very committed to comply with GDPR in any possible way. 
there is, when you see something like person finder, interesting questions that come up. So for all that, we need to work with the local data protection authorities to understand, okay, what does that mean for that specific solution? Because when GDPR was put into place, they might not have specifically thought about that kind of use case on, oh, what about the person finder tool? So we try to understand from them what it means or how GDPR applies to that specific solution and then would comply with that. But it is something that clearly it helps consumers, but it is also something to think about when you build those uh, solutions. So... Yeah, I mean, we do work a lot with local partners, and I think that's what Malta referenced a lot. Um, so what we... We kind of think about our social impact efforts um, in three ways. So we do what we can with our, with our products. So wherever we feel like we have core competencies that we can leverage, so our products like Search and Maps, if we can um, use that in ways for good like this, we'll do that, of course. But then we use our external, um, not external, but um, philanthropic arm to fund external projects that aren't as close to what we're expert at. Um, so in terms of funding, it's kind of, it's still within our mission statement and it's still within, I think, our core business, but um, yes, external yeah. partners are absolutely involved. I think um, what is interesting is if you think about a crisis, we don't really think about it as necessarily doing specifically something for just a humanitarian course. The Paris example is great to see where someone searches for it, a user, we want to provide the best possible search result for that user. And providing travel advice to Paris is not necessarily the best possible search result for that user. And that's why we decided to kind of change the way that the search results look, uh, look on that specific case. And we do that for a lot of the humanitarian things or moments that people may have when they are affected with those things. Um, what is happening with Loon? I don't, I don't actually know the latest on Loon. I would love to know. Um, I, but... I think we... In I mean, Rica. it's an interesting experiment for those who don't know Loon. Um, it's basically a very ambitious project to bring internet connectivity to anyone who may not have internet connectivity. And it's basically internet connected to a balloon that is in the stratosphere, I think at like 30 kilometers on, on the air, and there's basically just balloons flying around the, uh, the Earth. I think we did some experiments in Sri Lanka, we are trying to roll that out, but it's kind of non-trivial to just send balloons around the world um, to do that. But, uh, but actually, um, in Puerto Rico, we did launch Loon to bring connectivity there. Um, because, of course, the solutions that we referenced, um, SOS alerts, are entirely useless if people can't connect to the internet. So in this case, where connectivity was a huge issue, we launched Loon, um, and that was, I think, fun for the team that worked on that to be able to leverage such a cool piece of technology. Um, but beyond that Puerto Rico instance, we have not done anything with Loon. And I think that's maybe a good segue to that last question on like, how to make sure that our ideas are not just for nothing but actually useful. I think there's a couple of elements. For everything that we do at Google, we are a very data-driven company, so we do research that is like very metric-focused and, and try to understand whether what we do is the right thing to do. But Zaskia and my job primarily is to work with those humanitarian experts, with local authorities, with governments, or with NGOs to understand is what we are trying to do here the right thing to do given the circumstances because you may know them better and in fact often those NGOs or humanitarian experts might already have something where we just try to cater their needs whether this is a grant or whether this is a piece of technology that we can provide to them. Um, I think we will be around for beers and <laughs> drinks so if you have questions or just want to shoot an email, anything, um, please contact us anytime. We'd love to hear more thoughts, more ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank and, you. Uh, really interesting stuff. So,